The topic of this lecture is meiosis, the specialized cell division that eukaryotes use to go from the diploid condition with two copies of the genome to the haploid condition to make gametes or spores, gametes in the case of our life cycles. Meiosis, like mitosis, begins with DNA replication So there are four copies of the genome, but then goes through two successive chromosome segregation events, typically punctuated by cell division. These are meiosis one and meiosis two. These chromosome segregation events take place without intervening DNA replication. Now, you might think this is approximately the same as mitosis. Is meiosis just mitosis with an extra step to reduce the complement of DNA from two copies to one? No, it isn't, not at all. Um, if you had just one chromosome, and you might think to yourself, why do you have more anyway? If you had just one chromosome, then meiosis one is the stage at which your parents' genomes would separate from each other. That is, meiosis one would undo fertilization. The parental homologs of chromosomes are segregated at meiosis one, and because meiosis involves homolog pairing and recombination, it necessitates a special mechanism for spindle function. Meiosis II mechanistically is very similar to mitosis, and so we won't have much more to say about it here. If there were no recombination taking place, meiosis would nevertheless ge generate gamete diversity because we do have more than one chromosome, we have 23 chromosomes in our uh, haploid complement. Each time we pick, one presumes randomly, a paternal or a maternal copy of each chromosome, we're shuffling the deck. So let's take a look at some, uh, some real numbers for popular organisms. Fruit flies have four chromosomes in the haploid complement. The haploid genome consists of four chromosomes. So there are two to the fourth ways to shuffle those to get different combinations, 16 possible outcomes without considering recombination at all. Picked randomly from the middle of a list on Wikipedia, tomatoes. 12. 2 to the 12th is about 4,000. So shuffling alone creates quite a bit of uh, gamete diversity. We've got 23. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 8 times 10 to the 6th. So almost 10 million just from shuffling. Great white sharks. Thank you, Wikipedia. They have 41 chromosomes in the haploid complement. So that's 2 trillion. But why stop there? The humble horsetail. has over a hundred chromosomes. So why bother with the combination anyway, incidentally? Why not just make lots of tiny chromosomes? That would be a great question to bring to question time. Okay, but meiosis does involve recombination 
Following DNA replication during meiotic prophase, as chromosomes condense, they, the homologs find each other and undergo crossing over. I'm going to draw out a morphological depiction of the stages of meiotic prophase for a pair of chromosomes that come in paternal and maternal copies. Now, following DNA replication, these are sisters, two duplicates of the same chromosome, right? So these are sister chromatids. Whereas these, this versus this, these are homologs. That is, your mother's and your father's chromosome 17 or whatever. They may have different sequences in various places, perhaps even some, some big inversions or something like that, but they're basically the same book. That's what we mean by homologs. All right, now bear with me while I draw out over time during meiotic prophase, the morphological transformations of these chromosomes, and then we'll talk about what those changes entail. Remember, time is running this way. I'm going to mention at the beginning one of the last things in time that I'm going to draw. Ultimately, the chromosomes, the sister chromatids, are held together by rings of a protein called cohesin. The cohesin links between chromatids begin to be established early in meiotic prophase. I'm only going to draw them at the bottom just to, uh, for clarity's sake. Now, that process of linking the, the chromatids and uh, Condensing them into big loops characterizes leptotein. That just means thin threads. During leptotein, the condensing chromosomes also begin to be associated with some sort of protein complex that holds these big loops of chromatin and that protein complex ultimately becomes a, a kind of a spine for these condensed chromosomes as they go through the rest of this process. I need to give myself a little more room here to match the drawing for zygotein. Sounds like a zygote, but this means paired threads. During zygotein, the homologs start to become closer and closer together. What's going on here is that during leptotene, as the chromosomes are condensing, double-strand breaks are introduced into every chromosome. 
meiosis begins with chopping up the genome into little pieces, astonishingly enough. And we're talking hundreds per chromosome. During zygotine, around these double-strand breaks, regions of single-stranded DNA explore other chromosomes looking for a similar sequence. As double-strand breaks are introduced, enzymes trim back one strand, proteins stabilize the single strand that remains, that goes on a homology search from, say, the maternal chromosome to the paternal one, if it finds its homologue, that is. Imagine how long it takes for a strand of DNA to pull all of the other chromatin in the nucleus looking for a sufficiently homologous stretch. Let's hope it doesn't go wrong. So strand invasion during zygotene initiates homologue pairing. This is the initiation of DNA repair as well, because having chopped out the genome, you know it's not gonna stay that way forever. We're gonna fix it up, right? Having found their homologs, the chromosome synapse. Now, uh, this characterizes Pachyteen, pachy, as in pachyderms. Elephants have thick skin, pachyderm. These are thick threads. The chromosomes are condensed um, right up next to each other and structure develops between them. Uh, there's a central axis to this so-called synaptonemal complex, a bunch of proteins of some sort, zippering these things together. And really, there's even a ladder that develops looking like the teeth of a zipper very much indeed. So during zygotene, homologs are finding each other through this homology search based around the double strand break sites. During pachyteen, this process of synapsis initiates around double strand break sites. And whatever is happening in this structure. The goal here is for DNA repair to recreate whole chromosomes. But in doing so, it leaves a few, a few sites where The strands are scrambled in a crossover. The word for this is chiasma, singular, or chiasmata, plural. Finally, during, I guess I can uh, extend that a little bit to match the diagram, during diplotene, which means double threads. Synapsis loosens and uh, leaves the homologs entangled by the chiasmata. Now, before we talk about how crossing over works, Let's zoom out a bit for a schematic view of what happens during uh, meiotic recombination. 
we'll start out with our meiotic chromosomes. We're going to draw them in this very stylized way. Here's our P1 and P2 chromatids. I'll color code them and also I want to take a look at this schematically as well. The schematic representation is going to be like this. Let's say The paternal chromosome has some sort of allele on it. These are duplicates, remember, so they're going to be the, except for DNA replication errors, as close to the same as they can be. And the maternal version has some other allele on it. The result of crossover during prophase of meiosis is to produce from these two a so-called bivalent. It should be bivalent, but geneticists always say bivalent. Until we fill in the color code, it's not going to be clear at all what's going on here. But essentially, we have one of the paternal chromosomes, chromatids, excuse me, and one of the maternal ones intact. Then crossover means this. That these two have swapped chunks In a schematic representation, that's going to look like this. One paternal chromatid intact. One maternal chromatid intact. And the crossover, nobody knows who's getting what until this junction is resolved. Okay. But once it's resolved uh, in this thing, the bivalent. What I want to point out here is that it is held together by these interfaces here. These interfaces between sister chromatids. This was the sister of this here, and likewise this piece here was the sister of this here, produced during DNA replication. The crossover has uh, left this chunk attached to its homologue and cohesin rings link these sister chromatids still at meiosis one when metaphase becomes anaphase it's the dissolution of those cohesin links between sister chromatids that allows this th half of the bivalent to go that way and this half to go that way Most of the double strand breaks that are introduced into these chromosomes during meiotic prophase at the beginning of leptatine are resolved without crossover. Okay. A few of them have to remain, one or two have to remain, to produce this configuration in which the homologs are linked on the meiosis one spindle. Crossovers interfere with each other, and that appears to be one of the functions of the synaptonemal complex, so that you don't get several crossovers in the, in, in the nearby vicinity. So double strand break repair goes like this. Uh, first step, starting with, now 
this is not a chromosome, this is just a stretch of DNA within a chromosome. And these represent not duplicate, duplicated sisters or anything like that. These are the two strands of the double helix, okay? So obviously the first step in making a double-stranded break is to cut it somewhere. Whenever a double strand break appears, some enzymes show up to chew away one of the strands. That's the first step in DNA repair. The point of this is to create single strand breaks, single strand stretches, excuse me, around the double strand break because those stretches of single stranded DNA can invade another piece of DNA and look for a match. There's all sorts of interesting biochemistry about, you know, the proteins that stabilize uh, single stranded DNA and mediate the homology search. We're not gonna cover that. We're just gonna go into a schematic here, a schematic view of this. Once these have been chewed back, let's say this strand, if it can find a friend, goes looking for a sufficient extensive sequence match. I'm gonna add a little wrinkle in here, which is to say that this green chromosome is a good match except for one little spot where there's a mutation. So the next step, this isn't really a next step, it's more of a 3B. Let's just say, uh, that invading strand can use the green one as a template for DNA replication. Where the dashed line here is meant to indicate the newly replicated stretch that spans the original break site. Of course, whatever differences exist between these uh, copies, no matter how similar they are overall, whatever differences exist between them in this region will therefore be copied into the new version that's being made to span the breakpoint. Now, uh, it's possible that this could just result in, and often does, just result in simple repair, that is, um, if we just uh, consider the, the blue ones at the moment, once we've got a stretch that covers that original breakpoint, it could be that we just get everybody back together in their original places and of course, this strand can act as a template for repair across that gap. Leaving only the little problem of this mismatch. Well, we have extensive enzymology to fix mismatches introduced in the DNA, for example, if you stay out in the sun too long or something like that. So mismatch repair, we'll have to choose which version to uh, correct it to, resulting in either gene conversion if this change gets copied into the other strand during mismatch repair, or a total non-event. Okay, so, so this is the simple repair outcome. Um, but of course, 
That's not the one we're interested in in the context of meiotic recombination. Um, so let's proceed and say this uh, green strand now becomes a template for repair in the gap. Next step is going to look like this. Okay, so this replacement of the resected strands leads to an intermediate stage that's going to have uh, our top strand with the gap filled in by copying the homolog. This green one down here has never been touched, it's intact. The other green one hasn't been touched, but it's currently paired with the homolog and vice versa. The question is how to resolve this. Okay, obviously some enzymes are gonna be involved. They're gonna come in and cut some strands of DNA and let's see, you could just snip this blue one and green one and paste them together here and that'd be fine. Uh, of course, you'd have to uh, stick them together down here as well. Um, and you could do the same thing over here, right? So this kind of double junction could be resolved with, uh, with little fuss and bother like so. So again, I'm gonna cut the blue strand here and just staple it to the green strand and, and vice versa here. So that means I'm gonna get a little green stretch over here, right? And um, over here, I'm gonna do the same thing. Um, again, this green strand down here hasn't been touched. Now, this outcome, this is a non-crossover. They haven't actually traded any segments. Yes, they've traded a strand in here over a stretch, maybe a few hundred or a thousand, two thousand nucleotides or something like that. And this, any mismatches in there might lead to gene conversion events of, or something like that. But um, that's what happens if we resolve these two junctions the same way. But if it so happens that we resolve one of them one way, cutting like that, let's say, and resolve the other the other way, let's because we could equally well resolve it by cutting here and cutting here. And now I need to make a little interlude to point out that the machinery can't likely tell what it's doing. Now I'm going to draw just one of these junctions uh, down here as a kind of a parenthetical comment before illustrating the crossover version. Let's say I have uh, one of these junctions. Now that's supposed to be passing behind there. I hope you can see how if I just take any two ends and twist 180 degrees or this way, whatever. So let's take this and twist 180 degrees. I'm going to end up with by twisting this straight one, it's going to end up like that. These are equivalent 
topologies, the enzymes that resolve these junctions probably can't tell whether they're doing this or doing this. Consequently, one of the possible outcomes from resolving this, this uh, central intermediate here, if these happen to be resolved in different ways, is to produce this situation here. The key difference being that now we've got blue, 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 blue along the chromosome going this way, and then suddenly at this crossover point, it is all green stuff from here on. Vice versa, the, this one down below, it's green, 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 all the way to the crossover point, and then blue stuff. That is, these two have now traded chunks. And that, what's the point of it all? Is uh, the crossover just a byproduct, a kind of an accidental consequence of DNA repair? We can't tell uh, what's going on. Probably not as simple as that for the following reason. The function of the mitotic apparatus equivalent during meiosis, during meiosis one in particular, depends on crossovers. I'm going to briefly swing back to the other side of the board. To this picture over here, again, these bivalents, in which consist of a paternal and a maternal homologue, physically linked, they are generated by the crossover and they are held together by the cohesion between sister chromatid arms beyond the crossover point. So how is spindle assembly so different? Let's go back to the other side of the board. For comparison, we're going to look at what happens in mitosis. with a schematic chromosome. Now I'm gonna give it two arms. DNA replication produces two copies. These copies line up at the mid plate of the mitotic apparatus as their kinetochores recruit microtubules again the sister kinetochores are the attachment points for the mitotic apparatus they measure tension across that joint between them and when anaphase transpires one daughter cell gets one complete chromosome and the other gets the other complete chromosome and same story for all the rest in the cell, right? So mitosis looks very simple from that point of view. Now let's look at meiosis. Now I'm just going to color the kinetochores on my paternal and maternal homologs for simplicity. The maternal one is going to be orange. Oh, that's going to be bad because my spindle fibers are orange too. Oh, well. Okay. Again, let's make some sort of allele on the paternal one. And some other sort of allele on the maternal one. Likewise, we start out with DNA replication. That just makes copies. All right, I mean, you can always, you can already probably kind of see where this is going, right? The, one of the purposes of mating, that is why we put together diploid cells, is to combine potentially useful traits or to mask deficiencies. So let's say um, 
I lack some metabolic enzyme. Well, maybe my mate has a good copy of that and our offspring will do just fine, etc. Or they might be useful mutations. You know, these alleles might be beneficial ones. Let's say I can uh, see into the near infrared a little bit. Some Welsh people can, for example. Whereas my mate has um, an enhanced ability to synthesize vitamin D and uh, the low levels of illumination or something like that, right? Uh, perhaps our offspring will share those traits because we combined our, our, uh, our genomes, right? Now, crossing over, takes it a step further. Again, let's um, put them on the, the segregating apparatus at meiosis one. The kinetic core pair on one homolog attaches to one spindle pole, whereas the kinetic core pair on the paired homolog attaches to the other spindle, like the other spindle pole, like so. Okay, here's where the color choice becomes slightly unfortunate. Once these line up at the midplane, whatever criteria they use to judge, again, tension across kinetic cores, except this time the tension is transmitted via the entire chromosome. They have to get scissored apart. The cohesins are snipped by uh, enzymes that are activated anaphase onset. And those um, chromosome arms come apart. And what we get in one cell is in one of the products of um, first meiosis, the blue indicates that these kinetic cores once came from the paternal side. Of course, in the other cell derived from first meiosis, the kinetic cores will have come from the maternal side. And let's say the outcome is something like this. Now, second meiosis is essentially the same as uh, mitosis. That is, the kinetic cores of a pair recruit microtubules on the spindle. Ooh, almost draw, drew two of them, but at this point, there is only one. You can read ahead and see if you can figure out why. And the same kind of thing is going to be happening in the other cell with the, uh, what was uh, once the maternal homolog, right? Leading to the following set of meiotic products from the point of view of this single chromosome. One of the four gametes derived from this meiotic division gets something that looks essentially the same as the P chromosome started out. One of these gametes gets a chromosome that looks like that. One gets
something like this. And finally, one gets something that looks essentially the same as it looks the same as the maternal chromosome we started with. Now, this particular outcome illustrates some of the possibilities. So if these were deleterious mutations, we've just created a gamete to uh, found a future generation with. We've just created a gamete that contains none of those deleterious mutations. Well, that's great. Alternatively, let's say these were beneficial mutations. They're on uh, different chromosomes and uh, different arms of the chromosome and different lineages, but we've now created a chromosome to stick into a gamete in which these two beneficial traits travel together. And that is one of the purposes, as it were, of meiotic recombination. So if that all sounds um, optimistic, I want to leaven it with um, a little chapter opener I found in this book. This is The Gene, An Intimate History, published a few years ago. And uh, I haven't read the whole book, but it starts off well. It starts with a little snippet of a poem by Philip Larkin. They fuck you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you.